Okay, thanks. Okay, let me let me make some more wide introduction about what what would be the reason for me to be here today. So uh, the 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 objective is that uh, uh, I mean initially I, I I was aimed to to give you an overview about the say high performance computing trend and so and then I look at the at the program of the school and then I I saw that. Uh, at some point, there will be Professor Michele Parinello, and then afterward, there will be Thomas Schuldness, who is the director of one of, of the main like, performance computing center in Europe. And then I say, well, I think these people will definitely give you a trend on what will be the, well, Michele Parinello will definitely uh, talk about more the uh, scientific challenges and the prospective in science, computational science that you will be dumping into in the next uh, five, 10 years or so. But I'm, I'm quite confident that Thomas Schuldness will also go into technology, trend of technology, because this is most of his field. And so I say, well, so let's, let's, let's do some basics. So let's, let's just, uh, uh, or let's focus more on, on what are the aspects of technologies that impact more on, on software nowadays, and also uh, give you the foundation in terms of uh, what is the base of parallel application. I don't know, I mean, I, I, I see some known faces here that have been previously to some of our programs. And, uh, uh, but, uh, I mean, I think that most of, many of you will benefit of this, uh, of, of the lecture of today, and especially the lab session, where I will show you basically what are the, the, the basic programming paradigm that are behind the parallel application that I think most of you uh, is already using. So at the ICTP, I mean, why would be a person that, uh, let's say, I wouldn't say an expert, let's say just experienced that for the last 10 years, I mean, on this, on this field working on, on uh, high performance computing center, why would be a person like me working in a center for theoretical physics? And the, I mean, the fact is that, uh, uh, as, as we will see today, I mean, the, the, co the complex of technology and the complex of software packages is getting bigger and bigger, and the gap between uh, theoretical scientists that anyway need as oxygen, I mean, the use of computer for science, and the, the, I mean, the, the, the technological background needed to master today's state of the art in terms of, of software packages, I mean, it requires people to, uh, to be trained and to be, I mean, uh, and to be, uh, exposed to topics that are not so common in general uh, courses for computational science. In fact, I mean, one of my main rules here is to basically develop educational, pro well, one, one is to assist the, let's say, the community itself uh, to access to parallel systems, but the other, in which is actually basically 80% of my time today, is to develop and, and deliver uh, educational programs, short-term, long-term educational program on uh, parallel computing, parallel programming, and high performance computing. Okay, so we, we are here in a, in a course of computational science, so I mean, everybody should, be, uh, know, should know here the, the answer to this question. I mean, why, why do we use computer in science? This is actually an historical issue. I mean, all these three main pillars here are, are the, are reasonable answer to the, to, the, to the question why we use computer in science. And actually, we can also add, if you want, uh, I, 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 I don't mention it here, but I mean, also visualization can be one of the pillars of, uh, of, of the answer of this question. So definitely to solve a complex uh, uh, problem that we couldn't solve otherwise, do it, I mean, do or be able to predict uh, events that uh, we would be waiting years, or, or maybe it would be impossible to, to study otherwise. And then also recently, uh, came a lot of this, uh, this last pillar. So the fact of uh, uh, computer in science are actually more uh, and more applied to uh, evaluate models and, uh, and evaluate the correctness of, of models. But while, I mean, here we are a computational school, so while it's, it's trivial to understand why we need computer in science, I don't think it's always trivial to understand why people move, or recently, I mean, all politics, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, let's say, fundraising, move from talking about uh, scientific computing to talking about high-performance computing. 
And, uh, and so, I mean, so, and, and, uh, but it's important to understand this, this difference because scientific computing can be any time I use a computer for science, okay? But instead, high performance computing, even so that, uh, uh, as I say nowadays, a lot of different domain of people are talking about this, giving a lot of different uh, answers to it. Uh, we refer, I refer here, I mean, this is my idea of that, to high performance computing to any time I want to make something faster. Any time I dump into the need of make, or make my simulation or, or, or get or reduce the uh, time of simulation. So HPC can be definitely made on workstation. HPC can be made on desktop. And HPC can be made on laptop or smartphone. I mean, HPC is, uh, for me, is, and this is actually the, the way I will, I will tackle this, uh, this, this session of lecture today, is to understand which are the technological issues to get code run faster or also what are the technological issues that progr programmers have to ha uh, deal with to deliver efficient program. And then, of course, HPC can be made on, on supercomputers. Supercomputers are the most powerful platform, platform uh, worldwide uh, that allows to uh, tackle scientific uh, challenges that wouldn't be possible otherwise for problem of memory, of uh, time of simulation, storage, whatnot. But we don't really need uh, to have a very, let's say, exotic or, or, or massively parallel system to run uh, or, let's say, to, to get the faster result compared to what we are used today. So we do definitely do uh, AI performance computing on Linux cluster, like the one we have in, in, uh, in ICTP and the one we have also uh, recently deployed together with TISA. We can also do high performance computing on grid and cloud. I mean, if we target to, to speed up and to, and, to make, and, to, and to get faster time to solution, even on those kind of platform, I think we do also high performance computing. So in general, I would say that uh, I, I will refer to high performance computing like high productive computing. So something that I do in order to get either faster result or to exploit more efficiently my, the technology that I have available. And now, here we come at the real question here. But why would you matter to that? Well, usually I am in contact with a lot of, for example, PhD students that, you know, they have been uh, committed to study a small system and, uh, and, uh, and they, I mean, and they do what they do with their own uh, desktop or let's say they access to a cluster and they do with using one, only one node, okay? And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the feedback that I have usually with these people is that they don't really need to know why they need to go faster, okay? But maybe two, three weeks later, or one month or two months later, the same person will, will come to me desperate because uh, he needs to have results for the, for the week after, and he doesn't know, he has no idea how he can do that. Yesterday happened to me that one, I, I'm registered, but let's say yesterday happened to me that one of the scientists at ICTP came to me desperate because he just developed a program, his own, and he needs a, a serial program, and he needs results for a conference next week. And he was running his simulation that takes five or six days on, a, on an ICTP desktop. We have available 2,500 cores at ICTP, so it was just a matter for him to uh, apply some of the generic rules of parallel programming to what he recently developed, and he wouldn't have dumping this issue. Beside the fact that after three days of simulation, his, de his desktop crashed, and so he, he, was, he, he, will, he, he will not be able to complete the simulation for next week. So at some point, it's likely that uh, for even for, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical uh, science, you will need or you will dump into the issue of uh, getting faster results or even simply scale your problem size up to the point that the problem, si that this, this, the, the problem doesn't fit the technology that you might, you, you have, you couldn't have available. Then if you are lucky, you are a CTP where uh, IT people 
try always to um, accomplish the quest of scientists, you might get up to the point where you get a 64 gigabyte desktop, uh, you know, 64 <laughs> gigabyte memory RAM desktop, which is kind of crazy. We've considering that we have hundreds of nodes on available here between ICTP and CISA that have much more than those memory already available. Okay, but you know, like sometimes people need immediate, immediate result, immediate feedback, and so you know, we buy memory, we bring the memory to the lab, to the to the office, which would be actually the other way around. So the scientists should join the platform that is made for that. So it is, it is important for us to make a little bit of dissemination on this concept to try to, let's say, I don't want to say educate, but at least inform people on, on what are the main aspects of, of or the, the main side effect of this. So problem become also more complex, and that, that's what I was saying before. But on the other end, we'll see actually uh, today, is not only a matter of, of, of uh, uh, let's say, bigger problem or faster time to solution, but nowadays we are also at the point that if we don't improve, what is it? Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> if we don't improve our, uh, let's say, our software system, we might risk to get slower and slower time, time to solution as more as the, as the technology evolve, because our software system is not longer able to support uh, or to, or to uh, run on, on, uh, on current generation of computers. Or uh, uh, even more, we, we, will, we will reach the point, and this is already the, the point where a number of scientific, of scientific communities are, we reach the point where the, the, where the, the essential tool for our research is no longer suitable for running on a platform that uh, are based on uh, devices that need to be programmed differently. Okay? So, and on the other end, I mean, I think that uh, HPC should matter in science nowadays, or let's say those concepts, those, those general concepts should matter in science nowadays because it also represents a big opportunity for uh, uh, visibility for uh, why not finding a job position tomorrow or uh, having, let's say, an additional um, haste to spend compared with uh, uh, your uh, uh, colleagues that, uh, that do not know uh, those, uh, those aspects. I mean, basically, if you look at uh, uh, computational group, uh, most important computational group worldwide, they almost all have nowadays a figure within the group uh, that, that is uh, expert or that support the group in software development and, uh, and, say, and provide the background to, uh, to, to technological aspect. All right, so let's, let's start basically. So anything uh, get, uh, got more complicated when uh, uh, computer vendors had to change the business model of providing next generation of computers. So up to a given point, for vendors, for, for let's say computer manufacturer, the, the deal was to create a processor to shrink the, let's say, the silicon wave in, inside the chip and provide processor at higher frequency. Processor at higher frequency were uh, very uh, appetible, very interesting to the market, because for, for, for consumer, higher frequency was equal, equivalent to faster result to simulation. Okay? So people were attracted to buy new generation of, of, of computers because those generation of computers would have offer higher frequency, and then higher frequency was uh, equivalent to uh, faster time to solution, to run faster simulation. At some point, this business model break. Break for a simple reason that uh, the, 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 I mean, you teach me that the physics within the transistor arrive at the point where shrinking the, uh, I mean, the, the wave of silicon that is inside the chip, we actually uh, double the, uh, the, the power consumption, the power needed to, uh, uh, say, um, to, to power that, that particular chip. Indeed, uh, while the, the so-called Moore's law 
uh, keep increasing. So the fact that uh, uh, the computational power of a processor should double approximately, approximately each uh, 18 months, while the Moore's law continue, the, 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 the builder of computer had to change their strategy. So they couldn't keep to, in, to increase the frequency of the clock because of the, of the, of the problem of power consumption. So, that was, so they stopped to increase the frequency, and they started to uh, increase the number of cores, so of computers per chip. That is where we, we arrive at the point where we have uh, a multi, so-called multi-core system. Any of the tablet that you have on your pocket or any of the desktop that you access here at ICTP, any computer that you access nowadays has more than one core. Okay, so it has more than one computer inside the chip, more than one unit that can perform operation inside the chip. But on the other end, this means that uh, uh, while serial programs could have performed faster and faster with new, uh, as a new generation of processor before, we arrive at the point where in order to exploit technology, so to get advantage of a new processor, we have to increase the parallelism of our, of our application. Okay, yes? Hmm? Okay, the Moore's law basically says that uh, uh, the, the trend of the increasing of number of transistors per chip will double every, every 18 months, say every two years, okay? And, uh, and within this, uh, and uh, the say, consequence of this is that the power, the computational power of a processor would also double f every two years. Okay, but since the increasing of the of the of the number of transistors per chip arrived at the point where the uh, it wasn't longer able to deliver a processor be because of the increasing of the power consumption, vendors said, okay, we 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 limit the number of transistors per core, and we start to increase the number of core per chip, and we arrive at the at the, at the technology that we have that we have available these days. But uh, it's not only this one. It's also the fact uh, that while years ago the market trend was dominated by desktop computer and servers, okay, so basically uh, consider that uh, oh, I mean approximately $1 billion is needed for a vendor to design a new generation of chip. You can imagine that those, those vendors or this, this manufacturer before to build a new chip they, they make some uh, market investigation to realize which would be the target of their product, okay? So if, if, uh, if 10 years ago, those, let's uh, say, investigation of market would have said that the majority of computers are dedicated to desktop computer and to server, so they were ported to design processor for this kind of devices. Nowadays, if someone make a market about how to design the next generation of, of computers, you can imagine that there is something that definitely dominate the market. And those devices here that today dominated market, they, 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 they are big consumer of low power processors because they want, to, they want to consume as less as possible because the battery that, uh, that, that, that power those devices has to uh, steal as much as, as possible, okay? So, is, so even so, here basically I'm trying to summarize and to give you a flavor of the fact that uh, not only uh, let's say um, processor maker for la for for smartphone are interested in low power processor, but basically this trend extends to all the main producer of of processor for scientific computing, for desktop, for server, for supercomputers. So we arrive at the point that nowadays. Intel still deliver generic x86 processor, which are the one you can find in all desktop here. But at the same time, massive investment is to, is to be able to, to, to create or to, to produce so-called many core system. Many core systems, so kind of computers that are based on very low power cores, but with massive amount of cores. The same is for ARM which is actually the major uh, category of uh, uh, computers for smartphone and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and mobile phones that is actually basically the dominator of, of the computer market nowadays. 
We have also uh, NVIDIA that uh, came along immediately with, uh, or let's say, is historically related to computer graphics, so uh, uh, devices that are built on massive number of low power uh, cores that together gives a very high computational power. But then also IBM nowadays is not, is not uh, uh, longer interested in delivering um, generic purpose, uh, uh, generic purpose uh, processor, but is actually more interested in embedded market and to, uh, or to build a platform that can support uh, uh, more powerful device like accelerator. And then AMD too, but I mean AMD nowadays is almost out of the uh, HPC market. So, so, so you see the trend of all main device bu uh, builders is going into a point where anybody is trying to build a largely parallel processor. But largely parallel processor, it means largely parallel software. Okay? Because if the single core reduces the, the frequency generation by generation, the software, the serial software will, will run slow generation by generation. Okay, maybe you, haven't, you, you never realized this, but actually there are other two historical uh, components of, of a chip uh, that uh, requires parallelism, or that express parallelism. So one is the fact that any computer system nowadays is able to schedule more than one instruction at a time. Okay? So... What does this mean? Well, basically consider that if you have a processor that uh, is 3 gigahertz, you want this processor to deliver 3 uh, million of operation per second. Okay? But each operation requires a big latency. A big latency to take the data from memory, to move the data on the registers, and then to perform the operation, and then to move the data back to, to memory. If, this, if all this latency is equivalent to, I don't know, 10 or 20 CPU cycle, it means that instead of doing 3, million of 3 billion operations per second, you will do 3 billion divided by 20 operations per second. Okay? So already the design itself will drastically reduce the performance of your computer. So in order to, to hide this latency, the, the stages of computers have been divided in, let's say, have been uh, uh, made independent so that uh, different stages can be overlapped. For example, here I'm showing you a very basic picture where consider that this will be a full extraction where you first fetch the data, then you decode the extraction, you load the data, sorry, you fetch the extraction so you, you, you read the extraction, you decode the extraction so that the computer can understand it, you load the data, you execute an operation, and then you store back the data. As you can see here, at step two, basically you might have an overlap where the, while the first two instructions are, are already decoding, sorry, yeah, are already at the decoding stage, you have instructions that are at the first stage. And all this complicated design is made in a way that uh, at the end, uh, after n stages, you basically are able to get one result at each clock. Okay? So this is why nowadays you arrive at the point where if you run benchmark, for example, synthetic benchmark, those can arrive at 90, 95% of the efficiency of the CPU. It means that, I don't know, if you expect to do 3 billion operations per second, you will arrive to do, I don't know, 2, 2.6 billion operations per second. Okay? And, this is, and this is due to all the mechanism that is inside the, the chip, it's called pipeline, to create this, uh, to, to, let's say, to hide the latency to the memory access. Okay? But suppose that you have, so suppose that you have an extraction like this one, Okay, this instruction is very simple because, and, and it allows perfectly to exploit our system because in the mean, while we are doing A of 1, okay, and we are incrementing A of 1, of one we can already load the data of A of 2 because we know that the next extraction will be that one. Okay, but if you have something like this, this schema will completely break our pipeline, and the efficiency of our system will drastically reduce from 90, 90, 95% to, as I said before, 3 billion divided by 20. Because in order to load the next data, 
I need to wait the previous extraction to be completed. OK? This is, this is a very simple example of data dependency. And I'm bringing this to you not because I'm expecting you to, to, that you want to know pipeline, but I'm bringing this here because I want you to understand how complicated it is to develop software that uh, reduce at the minimum the data dependency. And the data dependency is a main issue to get efficiency in, the, in, in your technology. Why? Because you have this kind of system implemented in there. So you have some implicit parallelism within chips that are made to increase efficiency to hide memory, memory latency. But even simple things like data dependency can immediately break this, prop, this uh, stuff. Another trick that vendors are, are or let's say vendors, computer manufacturers are implementing nowadays to increase uh, computer power is the so-called vector unit. Any processor, any x86 processor that you might be using these days, so generic purpose processor, is capable to perform more than one operation at clock, per clock. OK? How this works? Well, basically, instead of having scalar operation, so let's say like this one, OK, when, when A of 1 is loaded in, in memory, even A of 2, A of 3, and A of 4 are loaded into memory. OK? So the, so the data is no longer one single scalar double, as you might be thinking at, but is a bunch, a series of, of, of elements of the same kind that can be processed in parallel. OK? You already have implemented this in any x86 processor nowadays. The last generation does uh, eight, uh, 16 double precision operation per clock. OK? But again, this works perfectly if I don't have a kind of data dependency of, let's say, if my algorithm in general, OK, hollow to process operation, uh, hollow to perform operation in this way. For example, consider the most trivial example, the, a matrix multiplication. When you have to multiply one row by one column, OK, that is a perfect schema to exploit this kind of, this kind of, 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 uh, of technology, OK? But as soon as you have something more complicated, all those technology become completely obsolete, OK? So there are components in, into, the, into, into, into today technology that are fundamental to get power processing, but it's very easy that scientific application, which are, let's say, usually uh, made by uh, more complex operations than matrix multiplication, basically screw all this. OK, so basically, we have, we have been seeing that uh, uh, we, are, we are nowadays living in a world where computers are getting parallel, not only because you know, we heard about parallel system everywhere, but because also small, I mean, I mean, simple processors are getting, uh, are increasing the, 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 the explicit parallels within them. But even, but moder other than the, the explicit parallel, which, which I'm referring to the number of cores that is growing, you also have in, intrinsic, so inside parallels, that is also uh, a, a fundamental issue to get uh, uh, let's say, high, high performance. So basically, today, there is no way to get uh, uh, or to benefit of next generation of computer if we don't think in parallel. And here we come to the third uh, pillar, which is even, even uh, uh, I mean, uh, as well important. So the fact that uh, now, so far, I'm already been talking about what makes operation faster? I mean, what, what makes computer faster in terms of uh, how many operations per clock we can do? But in order to, to let's say, uh, in order to increase this number as much as possible, we need to fill our CPU of data. OK? Well, 
This is all fine, despite the fact that actually access to data into memory is one of the most expensive operations we might have within a chip, both in terms of latency, so time to get to get to the point where the result is in the, in, the, in the chip and we can perform the operation, either in terms of power consumption. So uh, let's say engineers have been in inventing layer of, of memories that basically uh, should reduce uh, the time to access to, uh, to data in memory. Again, this is true, this works, but works only in, in some specific case. And if we go out of that specific cases, we dump into the problem where we always need to access data to the main memory, and we pay a lot of CPU cycles any time we access to one data. What is this case? Well, basically, this level here of memory works in a way that when a data is retrieved from the memory, nearby elements are also, retrieved, are also moved from the main memory to level of intermediate very fast, uh, let's say, memory levels. This is done because uh, engineers predict the fact that if you load a data from memory, it's likely that you will use the next element very soon and it's also likely that you will reuse the same element very soon. So if at, if at time t1, a of 1 will cost us 190 seconds, or sorry, 100, 100 nanoseconds, at the, to load the data a2, which is next to a1, but is actually loaded into uh, lower, uh, let's say, deeper level of memories, it will cost us up to the point of 1 nanosecond. OK, so after one load, if we are able to load the number of contiguous elements and to reuse them, the next access to memory will cost us almost nothing. Again, if we, look at if we look at a matrix multiplication where we have to multiply a column by a row, this is the perfect schema. Because we multiply A of 1 times B of 1. And then we sum it to A of 2 times B of 2. I mean, uh, uh, A of 1, 1 times B of 1, 1. And then A of 1, 2 times B of, of 2, 1. OK? So perfect schema for matrix multiplication. But suppose you have, for example, a random access of memory. If you have to access to particles that are all stored in different places, if you have this, this party, if you have these cases, this is exactly the time where basically any access to memory will cost you the full cost. And your performance will drastically be reduced. So it, so it is important that algorithms are designed in a way that they can exploit what is called the data locality. So data are reused as much as, they, as we can. And at the same time, we, we should translate algorithms and codes to perform operations that can be, as I said before, vectorized. So where we can perform more parallel operations on, on a given set of data. And then there is another technological issue, which is a trend. So the trend about how this, the, the, the CPU power is increasing respect to the memory bandwidth. So how much, basically, if I go back here, I can feel my computation. Okay? So basically, this is becoming a Ferrari that needs a lot of data to be processed together to be able to get the maximum computational power. But at the same time, the channel to, to, fu to fuel this, uh, this, this Ferrari is, not, is no longer suitable. And actually, the gap is, is always is increasing. Okay? This, this is what this uh, picture is about. Okay? So to show that while the processor are, 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 are keeping the, the, the trajectory of, of growing in computational power, at the same time, Memory bandwidth, so the way that we, we, we fool these computers, is not increasing at the same. Moreover, nowadays we are in cases where with this uh, multi-threading, multi-course multi pro multi processor, and then, uh, let's say, um, a number of processing working all together, the memory bandwidth is shared among all this. Okay? So the memory bandwidth that I, that I end up to have per process is even lower when we full load the processor sometimes. OK, so 
here I come, this is what I was uh, uh, just mentioning, the fact is that it's not only because, I mean, memory bandwidth is, is gradually increasing, even if much lower than what computational, how computational power is increasing. But at the same time, we, uh, we are creating, this is the design of, uh, what, let's say, a, a, let's say a, a representation of, of a processor, of a dual socket processor like we are one we have on our cluster. Uh, where we have, uh, um, where we get the complexity, where we have two different processors that see the same memory, but as you can see, even if I can see, if even if even if this is a shared memory system, you can understand then the mem the time to access to this part of the memory from this process, it won't be the same to access to this one because you have a much larger path, and at the same time you also have the fact that cores share layers of memory, okay? So all this caching that I was saying before, so the fact that when you load one data, then this data can be reused. To make this system working, it is, it is essential that there is no conflict in data access between all these processes. In fact, this is one of the, you can see the complexity of a simple dual socket x86 system we have nowadays in terms of how many cores we have, how many layer of memory we have, and the, 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 the way the, the memory shared, because at this stage the memory shared per socket, at this stage the memory shared per chip. Okay, so really, la big complexity for programmer. So it's not only the power crisis, but it's actually the programming crisis as well. And then, of course, everything becomes even more complicated if we then think at a parallel system where we have a single chip, or let's say single motherboard, connected on number of single motherboard connected all together through a network. And this is, the, say, the representation of what is a, a cluster Linux like the one we have available on, on here. And this is how it would look like uh, in a big data center, uh, all this uh, uh, plugged together. So we have said what, what does make uh, and, and has a drastic impact on performance. So how fast my CPU can work? So how many operations I can produce per uh, cycle? And how many cycles I can, I can have per second? At the same time, if I want to get this uh, goal I need to move data very fast from memory to CPU, because if, if any time I have to pay the full path to get data from the, from the main memory, my CPU will, will just go extremely slow. And then here we come, finally, uh, the performance, so the, 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 the time to, to my solution also depend by the way that we can uh, parallelize our problem, so the way that we can express the parallelism of our problem, so the way that uh, we, uh, we have to uh, divide our problem in pieces. As much as our problem can be divided into pieces, possibly independent among them, as much as I can get performance by nowadays system. If my, if my problem is not is, I mean, is not, let's say, uh, easily parallelizable, is not trivially parallelizable, then at some point I will dump into problem of scalabilities. And if I consider complex problem where I have different algorithms that scale together, like most of the application you would be dealing these days, then it, it, it becomes even more complicated to understand how to, how to parallelize and how to, uh, let's say, um, uh, increase the number of, of, of computational power on which I want to run my system because I will have uh, different issues of scaling. Now I will, I will show you a picture about this that uh, should uh, clarify this. And then at the end, even if I have the most power, powerful machine and I have the most uh, embarrassingly parallel algorithm, which means that basically it can uh, scale without any problem, every task would be independent, I always have to respect the under law which, say, which says that there always be, there is always a, 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 f a fraction of my simulation that is serialized. And so even if I, even, even, even if I can uh, uh, parallelize perfectly the 90%, the 95% of my application, I won't go faster than 20 times. Because if I, if I leave 
the 5% of my application out of the parallelization, so I can reduce that time. At the end, my, 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 my speed up, it reaches at most a factor of 20. You do the math, you see that. <laughs> okay, different way of, uh, there, there are many different ways of thinking in parallel. The most used are, uh, the, the, are these two that I'm trying to represent here. So the one you commonly are dealing with, so anytime you run, I don't know, CP2K or CPMD or, or any other uh, molecular dynamics code, is like you are, you are into this kind of parallels, the data parallels. So you have a data set. This data set is divided in, in, on, among different uh, processing units, and those processing units work together on the same data set to perform or to solve a problem. But there is also another way of, of, of thinking in parallel, and is the way where instead of dividing my data set in pieces, I divide my operation and task in different, uh, I mean, I, let's say I divide my operation in my task and I distribute them among processing units. In this case, I would have different processing solving different problems, but at the end, all this works together in a concert to reach the goal of one single uh, simulation. So how, how is this nowadays all programmed? Well, the basic idea is to, is to or let's say, the, the, the foundation is to think about uh, our friend uh, here, a multi-socket CPU. So if we think at this, basically we are in front of a 12-core system, which uh, uh, share memory between the two different uh, CPUs. And, uh, and, uh, and with this, uh, I have to think how, to, how, how I can program it. You wanted to say something? No. OK. I have up to what time? Uh, 10, no? I have up to 10. OK. And so, uh, so let's see, let's see how, how program runs on the system and how programs are normally, uh, uh, let's say, um, developed, developed to be able to run on the system. So there are two main uh, philosophy, which depend how the memory is considered. So if we think of the system as uh, one block, and if we log on, on uh, if we do SSH on this one, on a Linux system, we, we see and we, and we do like cat uh, slash proc CPU info, we see 12 cores, we see a memory capacity equivalent to the overall memory available in the motherboard. And so let's suppose we have, I don't know, 32 uh, gigabyte of shared memory, which would be 16 per slot, and then we have 12 cores overall. How do we program this? Well, there is one main philosophy, which is the shared memory philosophy. The shared memory philosophy means that uh, we look at that system as a single system, and we have one single process that is divided in, in small pieces called thread. I don't know if you ever heard about this, but let's say it's like a, a ch child or, or, or let's say a pro a other processes generated by one main process. Let's suppose this is our, I don't know, cpmd.x. That runs into this system. And then at some point, this is divided in pieces that will run each of one core. OK, so the system is seen as a whole system. One single executable is at some point divided into small processes that run together to, let's say, to exploit our compute power. OK? And then we, and, uh, and, uh, and th this system, I mean, works. We'll see this today. Uh, we'll, we'll, ex we'll experiment a multi-threaded program. We'll see uh, how it's actually uh, already easily, uh, there are a number of applications and library easily accessible that are so-called multi-threaded, which means that those library, even if you link them to a serial program, 
when you when you when you when you call this library when you call this library to solve a given problem this the problem can be performed in parallel and it is designed to run on those kind of systems okay but on the other end this this uh, kind of parading hence have some side effect what is the side effect well first of all is that if we if we work in shared memory so if if uh, any piece of my process can access to the same memory, I can have conflicts because I can't write a position of memory while another, another process is reading on it. Okay, so if, I, if my algorithm at some point, for example, two piece, two tasks of this process or two threads, let's say threads, want to access to the same memory area in so-called race condition, I have to handle that. Okay, so I need to be very careful that I don't have multiple processes accessing to the same memory area. And at the same time, I'm limited in scalability, because if I have 32 gigabytes of memory available, okay, even if my code would allow me to scale ever, okay, the size of my, of my problem in this case would be limited to the size of the computer I have available under me. Okay, even if I, with this schema, even if I have access to resources like the room I show you full of, of, of racks and, and full of hundreds of thousands of computers, the maximum size that your problem can, can, uh, uh, can reach is the size of the memory available on one single node. Okay? So the shared memory parading, so threads, work only on single nodes. Very important. Because I can guarantee you that it's very common that people think that on a system there are hundreds of cores, because maybe those hundreds of cores are divided in, in, uh, in 10 nodes. So there are 10 different nodes, each node co equipped with 10 cores and connected through a network. Okay? So people log into one computer and then spawn, it says, or create hundreds of threads. Okay? But hundreds of threads, in that case, doesn't work on the whole hundreds of cores available. Work, at most, on the cores available on one single node, so on 10 cores. Let me make another example. Suppose, suppose we have a room full of desktop, OK? Hundreds of desktop. Each, desk, each, each desktop would have one gigabyte of, of RAM. Okay? At the end, our problem could reach, uh, ideally, 100 gigabyte of RAM in terms of size, okay? But if I program, if I, if I develop my code to be programmed for shared memory, the maximum shared memory that, that my process can see is the memory available on one node, so one gig, gigabyte. So if I have, if in that case, if I even have 100 gigabyte of memory available, my simulation would be limited to be to get the size of maximum one single gigabyte. Okay, so this model is usually more trivial to implement. So it's easy, is easier to program because uh, it's based on it's based on on directive that you can add into your code at loop level, and this uh, paradigm will split trivially the loop uh, and and divide the loop into task. But it has this limitation. So the fact that uh, it, it, it doesn't scale, or it scales up to the memory available on one single node. OK? So multi-threaded, you find, you find multi-threaded library nowadays everywhere, because it's, very, it's, it's, it's much easier to get uh, multi-threaded parallels than the, one, the other paradigm that we'll see in a minute. But those implementations are limited to the memory of a single node. Well, on the other end, instead, if we look at this system has a distributed memory system, then our model can scale even outside our node. How is this made? Well, instead of having one, process, one single process, then, 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 is, then uh, it becomes a multiple set of threads that work together for a problem, we program different processes, so different, different instances of CPMD that in, 
that together work to solve the problem. But in this case, the memory is not visible. I mean, not all processes have the same memory, but the memory of each process in the, is independent. So having one process running on this core and having the other process running on this core, it would be exactly the same to have one process running on this core and having one process running on this desktop if those two systems are connected together. Maybe we can go back here. So if I, if I, if I program shared memory, OK, my program is limited to one single node. OK? If I program distributed memory, so if I think of my program as, different, as distributed data set that, that ideally all together represent one full data set, but this data set is, is physically distributed among processes, then my model can scale all on the overall machine. This, I mean, the lab of today is to give you a practical example of what are the difference between those, those, those two models. So here we come. How does the distributed memory works? Well, basically, any programming paradigm, parallel programming paradigm is based on how to describe communication. So how to make that those different instances can work together. Okay? At the end, the communication in programming is, it means uh, someone that writes and someone else that has to re that read the same information. Okay? Very similar to emails. Okay? Someone writes an email, it, that email goes in a box, which could be our, main, our, our memory, and then someone else will read that email from that box. That, that in, 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 in parallel programming, this communication is implemented in, in, in memory or via network, uh, but it's always the, the same thing that one process write and one process read. So how it is, the, how it is all this implemented in distributed memory? Well, if we are in shared memory, basically here is trivial because we have that uh, uh, all processes see the same memory. So if I, if I write, a, I don't know, a, a data, on my on my on on the on the memory address space of a process, all the other tasks can read the same data. But if I have different processes, this cannot be done because each process would see its own memory. Okay, this is true for any independent process that you have on your Linux system, for example. Each of them has its own memory area, and one process cannot communicate with another one, except they go through file or or other systems. Okay. And this is exactly what happened in case of distributed memory. So to make processes talking together, I need to find a way to, I mean, to, to explicit this communication. And in, in the, and in, uh, let's say, in the message passing uh, paradigm, this happens through the network. So, the, so one process communicates with another one by sending a message through the network. OK? So process A send, I don't know, uh, the value of, of phi to process B, sending the data through the network. Process B will have to know that this data is arriving, and will, will, it, will, it will be listening on network up to the point that the content of phi is arrived in there. OK? OK, so this is basically, this is implemented through the, uh, the, the, the so-called MPI paradigm. MPI is nothing more than a library that you include in your code and that allows you to explicit this parallelism. And uh, uh, so, so even if you see this uh, on, on system sometimes as a compiler, so as an additional tool for compiling, what you see is, is nothing more than a wrapper that includes your compilers and that allows you to compile parallel programs. But at the end, it's just a library. So while you would compile your code like minus AP, A, uh, IC, or GCC, let's say, GCC minus C hello.c, if you would have a name PI program, so a parallel program, you could even easily compile this as minus c, hello.c, let's say minus o, or let's say without minus c, so we link it, and then we do minus l and pi, okay? 
So being a library that provides the, the, the routines to make, to make process fit together, we can, we can easily compile it normally just linking at the end the library that is needed, as you would do with any other library. But we'll, we'll be doing some training today about this as well. So, okay, what is what is the um, wh what are the aspects of this uh, of this model of, of programming that you you would need to take care of, or let's say that programmers have to take care of? Well, the fact that this paradigm is based on nothing is shared. Okay, so any process is completely independent from the other. He will have his own memory area. He will have his own uh, file. Uh, Pointers, he will have his own uh, socket, he will have his own, uh, I mean, anything is related to a process will be replicated among independent processes. And uh, of course, this is, uh, uh, a, let's say, a model that, as I said before, allows to scale much more because it allows to go beyond the memory available on one single node. Okay, so there are, I mean, nowadays are coming up many, many different paradigms. I mean, we have other than the MPI that I was, present, I was mentioning before, which is the distributed model. We have those languages which are the PGAS languages, which are trying to make an extraction of the, of the distributed memory as it would be shared memory. We have the OpenMP, which is the way of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, program shared memory uh, system, and then you have specific languages for uh, devices that are uh, nowadays available as external uh, to uh, generic, generic processors. All those languages, all those models of programming do nothing more, or let's say differentiate among them by the way that they express uh, the communication among the different tasks. Okay? Okay, here we come. This is the, and this is at the end. So having said that, uh, we have parallels within cores, we have parallels within uh, nodes, we have parallels because of multiple nodes. Okay, at the end, to reach the best performance, our codes or our programs has to take care of all these aspects. Otherwise. The result is that uh, if, we, if we go, uh, or let's say, if we have serial program that doesn't include anything of what we said before, we basically are at this level of the performance. If we are single serialized program, but that can uh, exploit uh, the vector units so that can perform multiple operations at, at a time, we, are, we can reach this level of performance. Very similar is that if we can't exploit the vector unit, so if we can't exploit multiple operations at the same time, but we are able to parallelize our program, we arrive more or less at the same level of performance because the number of cores that you have per chip is equivalent to the number of operations that, uh, that each core can do uh, per clock. But at the end, if we want to get very high efficiency, we need to parallelize codes and parallelize codes in a way that can also hide the, the latency memory and perform operations in parallel. And you see that, uh, I mean, between the generic programming and, bit, and, and uh, 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 let's say, and the goal that we have to reach, there is a big gap in performance of the, of the, of, of, of the or, or two order of magnitude nowadays. Because if you consider a, a 20 core system that uh, is able to perform uh, 16 operations per clock, it means 20 times 16, which, 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 is, which, is, which is an important factor of, of, of speed up compared with the serialized program. Okay, why is important the ANDAS law and why is important to consider uh, the ANDAS law when, when, when we run in parallel? Well, because uh, uh, it's very common that when you, when, you, when you run a program in parallel, you expect this program to provide you faster time to solution. 
But it's also very common that, in, where, that while increasing the number of processes, your time to solution, instead of scaling down, actually goes up. Normally, I always receive people that have this kind of problem. So if this is the number of cores, or let's say of processes that you have, and this is the time, they, they, pe people, people sometimes, or let's say pretty often, come to me and say, why am I getting this one? So the, the time to solution scales down while it increasing of the number of processes. But we reach a point where we, we get an optimal level. And then the, the time to solution actually start to increase up. Well, this is because the parallelism ideally doesn't bring any of the red. OK, so let's say if I don't have any of the red, worst case scenario would be the following. Under slow. So I reduce the time of the parallel region up to 0. And then I'm still left with the such called serialized part of what is not parallelizable. Okay? This is the ideal world. So even, even, in, even in the ideal world, you won't get this to get to 0 because of the AMDA's law, because of the fact that there is always part of the program that I can't parallelize. Okay? But at the same time, we don't, we, don't, we don't live in an ideal world. We live in a real world. And, uh, and the parallelism is not only something that I can express to reduce my time, but the parallelism is something that brings overhead such that uh, I, there is a point where my overhead, instead of bringing me advantage, it brings me a disadvantage. So look at this case where you know, basically there is a profile of a generic application where we have, uh, uh, where, where I divide the problem in, uh, in, uh, in pieces, and, I, and uh, I try to understand how these different pieces work at the increasing of the number of processes. And for example, you see that the blue is, perfect, is, is, is ideal. Okay? So the blue scales perfectly with the number of, with the number of cores. Okay, so the blue will give, me a, a, will give me a very, very good curve in this sense. But on the other end, I have, this, is, this represents the, I mean, the time of simulation, how it is divided in percentage compared with the number of, 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 core, of the increasing of the number of cores. So while, while, the, while the blue line would be, represent a perfect algorithm for me because scale very well, on the other end, I have this part, which is the yellow one, that can that at the, at the increasing of the number of processes is actually costing me more and more within my application. OK? Actually, this, since here I am I'm representing the percentage of the time spent, and I'm not saying how much time I'm spending, this could also be that actually my time to simulation is, is, is decreasing. But the yellow part will reach the point where we'll take the 100% of my simulation and won't scale, won't scale down. OK? So I reach a limit of scalability in that case. But I have also problems, which, are, which, are, which, are, which I don't have here, which is actually, or, or let's say, I have also problems which, which I, can, I can see in a different chart, like, for example, this one, where I actually have part of the simulation, for example, like this green one here, even if it's lightly visible, that not only limit my scaling, but actually if I increase the number of cores here, this will increase my time to simulation. Because the overhead of communication between the processes will bring me higher time to solution, not faster time to solution. OK? So in this, in this case, we'll arrive at the point where my curve will explode up. So here I'm showing you how uh, Carparinello simulation on performed on Cineca by uh, Carlo Cavazzoni and Arrigo Calzolari, you might, you might know them. Uh, the, uh, um, I mean, uh, is actually a, a, let's say a profiling of a scaling up to thousands of cores. But then you see that even if this application looks to 
scale very well. Anyway, at some point, I reach the limit where my algorithm don't scale anymore. And then, and there is another important point here. All these pieces, colored pieces, basically represent different routine. And different routine uh, uh, represent different problem. I don't know, uh, orthonormalization, uh, FFT, uh, update of the coordinates, and whatnot. Okay? But all very different tasks, all these very different problems do not scale with the same nature. Some problems scale dramatically well, blue, but some other scale completely different. So, for example, this green stops scaling already at this stage. Okay? So, it's really common on nowadays applications which are they say composed on, 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 of, 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 different, of different algorithms, of, of, of solution to different problems, it's very common that, that the, 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 the component of my application do not scale in the same way. So it, take, so it takes an effort when considering scaling to understand what is the best level of my, of my, of my system. Okay? Let's say the best level in terms of scaling level. OK? OK, then saying that there are also uh, a lot of, I mean, with the, with the increasing of computational power available these days, there are a lot of uh, uh, way to express parallelism. It's not only one single problem that is parallelized and, it, and that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, it's parallelized for faster time to solution, but it's actually the, the computational power available gives us the opportunity to express many aspects of parallelism. So there is, a, there, is a, there is a way of, I mean, there is a, uh, an easy way of expressing parallelism through farming. It's called farming in jargon, which means uh, basically uh, run millions of, of instances of same processes on different data set. Not the same data set divided in pieces, but different data set. This is very much used in, for example, in high energy physics, in, uh, uh, yeah, also in quantum Monte Carlo physics. And, uh, I mean, and, uh, and, and, and while this kind of, of, uh, of uh, let's say, parallel expression wasn't really common years ago, Nowadays, with the fact that you have hundreds of processes available or easily accessible, this starts to become a, I mean, an important way of, of using parallel machines. Then, the, uh, then you have the case where there are uh, people that uh, run basically the same system, the same parallel system multiple times to verify the, the, the quality of, of their model or to basically just to pick uh, the, 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 the most common uh, combination of the input data set. And then, okay, there is also parameter space, which is uh, very also, also very common uh, applied uh, way to uh, try to fill all this computer power available. So it's not longer only one single parallel system, but sometimes it's also a combination, so a framework of software that work in concert to perform uh, or to express this kind of, of potential parallelism. Okay. Of course, everything gets even more complicated when we, when, uh, when we think that uh, on top of anything I've been saying in this last hour, we add uh, external devices such as accelerator. Why this becomes even more complicated? Well, because you have... Uh, 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 normally, you have different parallel languages to program these systems. And not only because uh, the, the programming itself becomes quite complicated, but also because uh, we dump into the problem that being those devices completely separated and, com and, con and work completely different from our generic uh, processor, we have to handle all the memory transfer and all the computation on those external devices. We, when I say to handle, it doesn't mean only as a programmer, 
but even as a user, it becomes really complicated to use these systems efficiently. Sometimes also because the programs are not, uh, I mean, efficient themselves. But even if you have a very efficient program for accelerator, as a user, it's very complicated to get performance out of it. Well, let's try to see why. Basically, this is the general concept behind accelerated computing, which is very similar to also uh, shared memory paradigm. So the fact that I have a program, I don't know, a serial program or already a parallel program, I have a section of that program which is extremely parallelizable, and I want to move it on an, a, an, an even faster device, which I can ident identify as an accelerator. Well, What is the generic, the generic schema behind it? Logically, eh? I, mean, I mean, then people also program it, but it's, it's, it's important to understand it logically as also as users. So we need to copy the data from the CPU device, where the data are in, initially are, because sometimes they came from a disk, for example, input data. We move them onto the, the device of the, of the accelerator. We perform our computation on the accelerator. And then, after that, very fast, and then after that, uh, we move the data back. So first of all, this schema already bring a big evidence that the parallels include an overhead. Because even if this device, and even if my algorithm is perfectly parallelizable, and the time to solution of my problem goes from 50% to zero, okay, even if the execution of the problem goes to zero, I, I, I need to pay the time to move data from memory back and forth, which I didn't have before. Okay? So this is an expression of how parallelism can bring overhead. Okay? Because in order to exploit the parallelism of this device, I need to bring into my problem the overhead of moving data back and forth an external device that I didn't have before. Okay? And I will arrive at that point, at the point where that overhead will cost me much more than what I actually benefit on going on that device. And moreover, even if the, the data transfer between uh, the, the, device, the external device and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the CPU would be extremely fast, I mean, I, 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 could I, I could reduce the overhead. But on the other end, I have the fact that actually the channel between the external device and my CPU is the slowest channel I have in my chip. Okay? So, when I talk about accelerator or when I talk about uh, whatever way to accelerate my computing outside my, my processor, people have to keep in mind that the, the channel to move the, the data from, from the chip to the, to the accelerator or to, the, say, the power, prof, the, the power processor need to go through the, one of the slowest channels I have in my chip. Okay? So it's not only an overhead because of the model, but it's also an overhead because of the, of the, 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 I mean the, the way the technology that I have to, to move data from back and forth, I mean, is extremely slow compared with the other. Order of, order of magnitude is low. So here we come, and I try to, uh, yeah. Well, nowadays we arrive at uh, up to 12 gig, 16 gig also on, 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 on modern, modern GPU device. I mean, the one we have on here, uh, I mean, on CISA, they are at uh, 6 gigabyte of memory. Yeah, this is also actually another limitation. Usually on, on accelerator, you have also a, a lower uh, capability of memory than what you would have on, on chip. So you cannot transfer the whole data set back and forth. OK, so now, now we come to a few, uh, few conclusions in a sense that, uh, so why everybody is speaking about accelerator today? Because it's a, prom it's a promising market. Why is uh, uh, accelerator promising for users? Well, because it represents, uh, it has a very high scalable device. It has a very uh, high 
speed memory within the device. And, and is actually, uh, I mean, fairly speaking, a, a low power uh, device compared with the, with the compute power that it can deliver. But we are not interested in, in why accelerators speed up simulation. We are interested in why accelerators do not speed up application. Because any time we try to run or to perform something on accelerator, we actually see that we don't benefit of it as, as we are thinking it. Well, first of all, because we have this PCI bottleneck that you know is the slowest channel to move data. We have the fact that, uh, uh, OK, accelerator represents a massive computational power available because of this uh, large number of, of, uh, of uh, low power cores that are inside it. But as soon as I move from a massively parallel algorithm to something that doesn't scale, and, I, and as, I saw, as I saw you before, within nowadays software, there are various components that do not scale all at the same time. So I might benefit a lot from moving one part of my code of my software in the accelerator, maybe because I have also to move less data. But on the other end, I will, I, it's likely that I will arrive at a point of my simulation where the problem that I have to solve is no longer suitable for that device. So if I moved all my data on the device, then I have to move my data back, and so on. And then, and then people tend to, for, to really to forget the Anders law. So the fact that, uh, again, I mean, there is always a portion of my code that cannot exploit the overall compute power available. So it won't allow me to scale ever. So, consider, so if we consider this approach, uh, And uh, we, we, handed, we handed our software to a very good developer, which actually identified that uh, the 50% of my code can be broke to an accelerator, OK? And is able to reduce the time to simulation at zero of that particular section of the code. My simulation itself won't run more than twice faster. Because even if I reduce the 50% at zero, I still have the other 50% that it won't benefit of the accelerator. OK? So when you heard about 10 times, 20 times, hundreds of times, this is all story. OK? Oh, well, is, it, it, it has to be the outcome on an unfair comparison. Because if you do fair comparison, OK? And if you consider complex software, not something that you know you you synthetically run on the on the on the accelerator to show that it's faster than a CPU. But if you consider a complex software that has I/O, that has some serialized part, that basic that possibly have some algorithms that scale more than others, it's very very difficult to find this, a solution that can be moved on an external device and give you a massive speed up. OK? Now, the problem is that, is that people nowadays are, uh, let's say, uh, misleaded by the marketing. Because when I started to do this job 10 years ago, companies were paid a lot of money to get 5 10% faster time to simulation. Because if you spend $5 million a year in compute power, 10% of reduction of debt, it means five, five, half million dollars. OK? Do we agree on this? So before all this marketing wave of, of accelerated system that brought people to think that uh, something magic is possible, 5, 10%, 15, 20 time percent of speed up was considering a new era. OK? So the message is not that. Uh, accelerator are, are a waste of time, and and it's not even that accelerator are a, are a, 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 let's say a fake technology, but the message is that if you, if if you consider, if you think at all these aspects that I try to mention today, you realize that it's very it, you you know you realize that when people speak about 10, 20, 100 times the speed up, something is bad in the equation. Okay. Moreover, 
why so complex using GPUs and, or let's say accelerator and why so complex to get a performance out of it? Well, because when we consider, I mean, if we have, if we have an accelerator that is capable of, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm just throwing number, but let's say uh, three teraflop double precision operation per second, okay? Well, if we plug that accelerator on a computer that is able to, to, de to deliver, I don't know, 10 giga, 10 giga operation per second, so let's say three order, three order of magnitude less, okay? Well, then it's likely that uh, I would benefit of that accelerator because if I identify big portion of my code that can run over that, okay, well, time to simulation can, respecting the Andal's law, time to simulation can be reduced uh, uh, effectively. But if I consider nowadays modern system that are, let's say, generically not one or two order of magnitude slower, but one or two times slower than what an accelerator can deliver, okay? Well, then I have to consider the fact that even if I move all my code on the accelerator, I'm wasting a big computational power available on my CPU platform. Up to the point that sometimes I should think that instead of buying an accelerator, I should buy another CPU platform, which, I'm, which I can use more generically, and I could exploit at the same way. Okay, so in order to get power out, out of an accelerated node, okay, in order to get to exploit power within an accelerated node, programmers have, have to think a way to benefit both of the CPU and GPU and the accelerated platform, okay? Because if we, dis if we discard one or the other, okay, we are wasting big part of the portion of, of the computational power available. So, and this is exactly what happened when running application on accelerator, okay? It's, it, it becomes important for user to get performance to be able to balance what am I doing on CPU, what am I doing in there, how can I make them working together without dumping into uh, load unbalancing. Here are some examples. Well, I'm taking it from the uh, PW code of, of Espresso because it's the one I, wa I was more involved with, but uh, it's the same for any other LAMPS, uh, uh, Gromax, uh, whatnot code uh, is being enabled on accelerator nowadays. So, okay, suppose we say, as I said, suppose we, we run only one process on the CPU side, okay, and this process goes to the accelerator and then uh, parallelized perfectly, we are anyway wasting our CPU platform. In fact, this is what, this is the case we have. Sorry, at the same time, where is it? Oh, there you go. At the same time, I can say, okay, I don't want to waste my CPU platform. So what I do is that I, I spawn as many processes as I can in there as well, and then I make them going into the accelerator altogether. Well, but in that case, I dump into another problem. And the problem is that I have basically, I'm not only accessing to the slowest channel I have on my system, but I'm creating a lot of, of, of concurrency to asking to that, to, that, to that channel, okay? It's like I have uh, like uh, one island connected to the mainland. I know that on Sunday, there is a big traffic of people, of tourists going onto that island to go to the beach. Eh? And I have, I don't know, possibility of, 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 of bridges. And then I close all the, the fastest bridges, I leave, I leave open all, only the slowest bridge, and then I have all these millions of people trying to access into it. Big mess. In fact, here is that what exactly happened in this case. If you force too, too, many, too many processes into the CPU side, then you will have conflict to access to this channel. Okay? So what is the ideal case? Well, the ideal case, I definitely don't know what is. I mean, uh, uh, that's why, as I, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, to get performance, sometimes uh, 
some pre preliminary benchmark is needed to balance all this. And this was needed at all years I, years I had, where I had only one processor with one high frequency. Nowadays, I have a lot of components that work together to get the same result. And if I have a lot of components working together to get the same result, I'm increasing the complexity of the system, of the software, and I am, and I am very likely to miss the load balance, which gives me the perfect, the perfect outcome. So what I do here, basically, I am, uh, I am basically mixing the two paradigms that I was presenting before. So instead of saying, I either have one process that I know it doesn't work well because it doesn't exploit the CPU side, and at the same time, I don't have n processes where n is the number of cores because otherwise I will create conjection to access to the channel, what the ideal case is that I reduce the number of processes to minimum, and then each of those processes will become a multi-threaded process. Okay? So basically, I have here two processes. OK, so you see the difference. So this is one domain, sorry, splitted on independent processes, distributed memory model. OK? Each piece of the domain is not visible to the other processes, except you go through this message passing that I was saying before. I have a model where I pack all my system on one single process but then I waste CPU time. Or I have the way where I can say, OK, I use a mixed, a mixed model. So I reduce the number of processes. I exploit the CPU anyway because I thread, so my, my cores don't slip. Okay? But at the same time, I reduce the traffic to, the, to go to the, high, to the island where any, anything becomes magic. OK? So even as users, all this consideration has to be made in order to find the right bone balance. I mean, in the last two, three years, computer scientists, uh, HPC centers, anyone is in the, in the area has been working a lot to, to, to find a way to reduce this, uh, I mean, the possibility of loan balance through uh, auto-tuning, so finding a way that is generic for this kind of system. But at the same time, we live in an era where this technology change every year. The software available for this technology change every year. So it is almost impossible to software development to find a solution that doesn't move into the hands of the user the responsibility of balance these things in order to get performance, of course. If you don't care about performance, then uh, anything gets easier. But here I'm talking about HPC. So. Then, so having said that, and, and, and tried to provide you a logic overview of what is the background, now, I mean, you can see that we, uh, I mean, we reach a point of, a, 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 I mean, an important level of complexity in the technology, which translates immediately to a big complexity in terms of software development. In fact, today, most of the application that you, you know, LAMPS, uh, NAMD, Gromax, uh, uh, Quantum Espresso, VASP, <laughs> uh, what not, uh, that offer a uh, solution on, based on shared memory uh, 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 programming, distributed memory programming, a mix of them, possibly accelerator, Basically, those software are built over layers, different layers, that makes those packages really complicated. So in fact, nowadays, we have, uh, uh, let's say, basic, basic implementation on, based on distributed memory access, MPI. So I have to write my program in order to, t to tell to a process at some point, look, communicate with the other one because you need his data. At more deeper level, I arrive at the point where I program shared memory because of the fact that I was saying before, because sometimes I don't want to create as many processes as the number of cores that I have, but I want to reduce at minimum the number of processes to avoid conflicts. And then, but then at the same time, to get advantage of the CPU power, I go threading. So OpenMP is the generic way to express 
uh, multi-threading. Then if I, go, if I have an accelerator available, I need to add to my program the part for the accelerator. And then if we think also at what I was saying before about uh, farming and whatnot, we get into the fact that maybe we have a Python layer that we add on top to handle all pre-post-processing and, uh, and process spawning. And then, even worse, if you want, we arrive at the level where basically we talk with the system administrator to say, look, I have such a massive parallel production that I want also to instrument the scheduler or to, or to, or to let's say, to, to, to address my scheduler to be as efficient as possible. I don't know, maybe because I have a client server model or whatnot. Okay? So, this is the, so, the, so all this, this complexity in technology that I have tried to present today translates in big complexity of software package for, for compute simulation nowadays. Okay, I am at the end. I think I am also late, but I take five minutes more. So, as I said, from the technological point of view, the memory bandwidth is one of the most critical bottleneck of modern CPU design especially because I, I need to fill always uh, a, a faster and, and powerful car. Uh, at the same time, I need to program efficient data pattern because otherwise if I create, as I say, data dependency or random access to memory, I'm not able to exploit the intrinsic parallelism of the chip and memory and, uh, and, level, uh, and, level, and different level of memory hierarchy. To get the maximum power, I need also to arrive at exploiting uh, internal uh, vector unit. We'll see this, uh, how it is possible today. And then, as I said at the beginning, this is the reason why am I, and I, I, I think this is the reason why am I at CTP. So the fact that the complexity of parallel systems requires a given technological background to master load balancing, also at user level, and obtain this set efficiency. I mean, even if you have a very good parallel software nowadays, if you don't understand how this software works in terms of, of data distribution and, and, and load distribution, it's very unlikely that you won't get any good performance out of it. Or, or, or simply you keep using it inefficiently. Okay, so consequence of software application. Um, okay, of course, uh, I mean, people have to design algorithms that uh, can express more parallels and can be more suitable for this kind of massively parallel system we are going into. Compilers also have to work very hard to create uh, and to be able to optimize codes in order to advantage of all of this. Okay, this is fine. And, 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 and then, of course, this, complex, this complexity is destined to increase even more because with, with highly availability of massively parallel system, the, the, there is always someone that think at the way to exploit the systems and to increase the possibility of, the, of, of simulation that we have. So what if you want to learn how to program all this? Well, we have activities that we organize at ICTP every year. We, we organize two or three activities per year, one dedicated to parallel programming, one dedicated only to what we call collaborative software development. So we do a school of two, sometimes three weeks, uh, only to, or let's say with the ambition, of teach people how they can get into development of complex software packages. Because there is a big gap between one scientist, his own, working in a lab and developing his own code, and, the, and, and someone, a scientist, that is open to the community, that he won't take advantage of the, of, the, uh, of the product of this community, but he will also contribute to the tools of this community. Because when you want to contribute to the tool of the community in terms of the software packages that I was mentioning before, you, you don't need only to know how to program, but you need to know how to make, produce clean program, produce modularized program, produce possibly efficient program, 
and be able also to work in concert with the others. Because if you download NAMD today, you spend two years of your life to improve or to implement something new for, for the NAMD package. And then after two years, you go to, I don't know, Johnstone or whatnot, and you tell them, look, I have this massive improvement. Please upload it to the software package. And then when it will do SVN, uh, I don't know what, uh, I mean, to merge your code into the distribution, he realized that your code is based on a two years old distribution that is no longer compatible with what is available today. He, he, will, he will discard your work, okay? And he won't give you the possibility to include that work in the, for, for the, in, into the repository of the software package you have been working for two years. Because the work that is needed for the main developer or the maintainers to include this package within a current generation of the software will require more than what you have spent to develop it. Okay? So we teach people how to, to work with the software version, with Git, uh, and with, uh, I mean, and, and, and basically be compliant with what the main developer of, of uh, complex software packages requires these days. Then we have the school on, on parallel computing and, and, and parallel programming. And then if you want to master of this, we also have uh, nowadays a master in high performance computing, which is a, a, an 18-month program. Uh, that is fully dedicated to high performance computing and parallel programming in collaboration with the, with the, with the groups of ICTP and CISA and is a full-time commitment program, eight hour a days for six months, the first six months, and then uh, three months of, uh, of different uh, scientific, um, let's say, member of the scientific community of the, of the two institution explaining particular scientific program, I don't know, parallel linear algebra, parallel FFT, whatnot. And then at the end, there is a, there is a program for, uh, I mean, there is six months for a thesis and a project. And uh, that there was written in the last slide, thank you for your attention, but that, that is gone. <laughs> okay.